Glad you stuck around for the second half hour of the Health Call Live radio hour. We are going to be talking about a problem that is said to be at epidemic levels across the country, and certainly that seems to be the case here in our area as well. It's called metabolic syndrome. You may also have heard it referred to as prediabetes. And my guest in this half hour is someone who treats this and many other conditions all the time. He is Dr. Ashok Kadambi, an endocrinologist from Fort Wayne Endocrinology. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, Lee. So let's talk a little bit about the incidents. Are you seeing, will you consider this a, an epidemic level? Absolutely. Not just an epidemic, but I would call it a pandemic. It's worldwide. And so you're seeing patients off the charts with this disease. Absolutely. In fact, um, the, the, the statistics say one in four, but, you know, it ranges from who you talk to, what you read. It ranges from one in four to, you know, uh, as much as 50, 60 percent even. And what do what these patients telling you when they come to see you? What is their complaint? How are they feeling? Yeah, well, in a word, lousy. Okay, they, they feel terrible, they feel fatigued, uh, lack of drive, lack of enthusiasm, sometimes frankly depressed, can't lose weight, tried everything, cannot lose weight. Uh, basically, they come to me for chronic fatigue and difficulty losing weight. In fact, those are the two most common symptoms. You know, doc, I can't lose weight, you know, and I can't uh, get any energy back. Mm -hmm. What's going on in the body with all of this? What's going on in the body? Basically, fundamental defect is something called insulin resistance. So, in other words, in order for you to keep your blood sugars level, you have to produce a lot more insulin. And it turns out that the high insulin is toxic. Mm -hmm. It causes a lot of problems, you know, such as inflammation, um, atherosclerosis, or blockage of the arteries and such. So, let's talk a little bit about the role of insulin, because some people have heard about this, but I'm not sure they fully understand. The role of insulin in your body is to get sugar to pass out of the blood into the cells. Without insulin, you do not get that energy transfer. That's correct. And so, when I have insulin resistance, what's going on? So, when you have insulin resistance, in order for the insulin to transfer the sugar into the cells, it has to interact with something called the insulin receptor and sort of think of it like a key opening lock, okay? So the insulin receptor is like the lock, and the key is the insulin. So if the lock is jammed, you know, you, it takes a longer time for you to open the, or it takes a lot of effort to open open the gates, mm -hmm. the sugars go in. So similarly, if you have a problem with the receptor, if the receptor themselves, receptors themselves are resistant to insulin, it takes a lot of insulin to open those gates. So this high insulin levels leads to toxicity. Yeah, and so as you mentioned, the inflammation and many other conditions associated with that. So we need to get our insulin levels down, and is that the function of these medications that you might prescribe? Correct. The fu you need to get the insulin levels down by whatever means. Diet, exercise, of course, can be very effective, but if, they, if those don't work, then certainly medications can help. So an indication that you might have metabolic syndrome, there are several different things. So because it's called a syndrome, it is a collection of symptoms, so not one thing. Yeah. And let's walk through some of those. So yeah. the, the, the clusters, you call them. Yes, the cluster of symptoms, yeah. exactly. Uh, waist size. Yeah, uh, depending on ethnicity, it, de it varies, but generally accepted is 40 inches in males and 35 inches in females. Anything more than that would be considered... Uh, uh, a, a, a marker for metabolic syndrome. A potential risk. Okay, so high triglyceride levels. High triglycerides, low HDL, mm -hmm. okay, and elevated levels of something called CRP or C-reactive proteins. Uh, those are risk factors for uh, metabolic or clue you into possibility of metabolic syndrome. And then also high blood pressure, and, and it's usually regulated yes. at what, 130 over? 135 or 80 is probably the cutoff these days. All right, so any three of those, you're considered to have metabolic syndrome. And if you have metabolic syndrome, what is likely to follow? Where, do you, where is this headed? Okay, well, once you have metabolic syndrome, you, you open up yourself to a lot of risks. For example, risk of heart attacks. You know, how many times have we heard of young people just dropping dead? You know, a lot of it could be metabolic syndrome. Second is athro is uh, strokes. Mm -hmm. The same process that happens in the arteries can happen in the blood vessels of the brain, narrow blood vessels causing stroke. Uh, the third thing is, of course, frank development of uh, over diabetes. So we are, this is really kind of a, an illness related to the success of our food chain, right? I mean, we eat too much, we don't move enough. Is that the primary reason behind all of this? Well, there's, there's a couple of reasons. I think that's probably true, that we, uh, we, our food is more refined, for, for example. Mm -hmm. We don't eat most of the raw foods. 
a uh, lo lot of the foods we get is refined that's because of convenience it's easy to store big shelf life so it makes it more profitable to make more refined foods um, second thing is of course we don't move around very much because of automobiles and, and such and the third of course is environmental to pollutants toxicity uh, those play a very important role in uh, clogging up your insulin receptors, causing insulin resistance and such. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. The ball starts rolling downhill and it's tough to get out of its way. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, one of uh, a scientist did a study in the, in the East Coast. He mapped out the incidence of diabetes and the number of automobiles and found a co correlation. <laughs> yeah, so we all <laughs> take it for what it's worth, but yeah. more cars means more diabetes. So if we'd all ride bicycles, maybe we'd be a lot better off. What about the hormone complex, complex here? What happens in men and their testosterone levels? Yeah, yeah. I have yet to see a, some. I have yet to see a diabetic or male with metabolic syndrome with good normal testosterone levels. They're all low. Okay. And that, in fact, that may be even at, in the future, they may be considered a marker for uh, uh, metabolic syndrome as well, low testosterone in men. And by the way, PCOS or infertility in women also, also, is, is, also, uh, is also very prevalent. PCOS being polycystic, polycystic ovary syndrome, syndrome. That yeah. is also associated with metabolic syndrome. So we've, we've kind of painted the picture here. We understand what the problem is. Now, what do you do about it? How do you treat these folks? Well, first of all, you need to reassure the patients that this is reversible. Okay, what they have is completely curable and reversible. And uh, you start your journey with just simple lifestyle changes, dietary modification. You don't have to go on any draconian diets necessarily, like a keto diet, though that can really be very effective. You can do very simple things as intermittent fasting. Okay, in fact, that's usually my first line. I tell them you can only eat only in a narrow window between noon and 6 p.m. Okay, so do not eat anything before noon or anything after 6 p.m. Okay, and try to do this at least three days a week. So let's talk about that in greater detail. I'm, I'm really interested in all of this. Mm -hmm. So intermittent fasting is, there's a lot of buzz around it, and it seems kind of faddish. So why does limiting food intake between those narrow windows make a difference? Yeah, well, it goes back to uh, basically uh, evolutionary, physio evolutionary physiology. If you're back in the caveman days, for example, when the caveman woke up, there was no food in the cave. There was no refrigeration, so he or she had to go out and, you know, seek uh, food. So they really didn't eat until around 11, 12 o'clock in the morning. And um, when it got dark, they had to get back to the cave, so there was no food. Right. So they didn't eat after dark. So, so our genes have not really fully adapted to our way of eating, which is, you know, eat a heavy breakfast, have late, uh, late dinner, that could be kind of uh, put a lot of stress in the pancreas and, and your uh, digestive system as well as the liver. So if I understood you correctly then, by, by limiting the amount of the presence of calories in my body, I'm giving my body a chance to get that insulin level down, mm -hmm. and so I'm not fighting with the insulin resistance challenge anymore. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I'm also reducing my calorie intake? Yeah, eventually what happens is your uh, your stomach will actually shrink and then you'll get full faster, okay, in this way, this technique. And secondly, what you said earlier was absolutely right, you're resting the pancreas. So in other words, your pancreas doesn't have to work as hard. And you're also making sure that the insulin receptors are not being overstimulated. So yeah. that's also being reset. So I get it. And then that also triggers something called autophagy in the body, which is very important. That's a process in which your cells kind of go into a cleanup mode since they're not busy processing, processing energy that you're feeding it constantly through snacking and that kind of thing. They then turn internally and start consuming con some components that might be malformed within themselves. And they kind of are going through a cleanup process, right? Yep, it's called cleansing, internal cleansing, how, internal housekeeping what have you but essentially the idea is to rest the pancreas rest the cells that make the insulin and also reset the insulin receptor Welcome back to the program. Our guest this half hour is Dr. Ashok Kadambi from Fort Wayne Endocrinology. We're talking about an epidemic, he called it a pandemic, of metabolic syndrome, a collision, a, a 
constellation, a grouping of symptoms that puts you at higher risk for heart attack, stroke, diabetes, many other conditions. And that so often happens during the commercial break. We're continuing the conversation here. And we were just talking about metformin, which is a drug many diabetics take. But if you want to try something to try to get this under control, you just told me about something that's 10 bucks on Amazon? Yeah, it's, it's something called berberine, which is basically a supplement. It's uh, essentially like metformin, which is a medication we use for treating diabetes. Uh, you can buy it on you know, online, Amazon. It costs about 10 bucks a bottle, and it's 500 milligrams of berberine. Uh, you can take that uh, to reduce your insulin resistance. And is there any, so do, should I be in that, in the diabetic world or in the met, uh, metabolic syndrome world, or is that just recommended for everybody to try? Yeah, I think if you've got a family history of diabetes and you're seeing you're gaining weight in the, around the waist, and, you know, and if your doctor ever checks your insulin levels or C-peptide levels, that, you know, you, you need to ask for the test because it's not routinely done, and you find your insulin levels is greater than 10 or your C-peptide is greater than 3, then certainly you can try this along with your diet. Berberine. Berberine. Okay. I'm sure it's also available at uh, some of our sponsors, the Health Food Shop and uh, Fort Wayne Custom Rx, as well as available other places. Yeah, we can get over the counter. And the good thing is, obviously, you don't need a doctor's prescription for this. Very nice. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about hormonal imbalance, and you told me that you've yet not seen a male patient with metabolic syndrome who doesn't also have a testosterone deficiency. So, testosterone therapy doesn't necessarily fix the the metabolic syndrome, but what does it do? Yes, testosterone therapy doesn't necessarily fix the metabolic syndrome, but it gives you enough motivation and drive to do the other things that you need to do to get that fixed. For example, exercise and diet is easier said than done, but the guy has no motivation because his testosterone level is like 200, it should be about 5 600. So, what do you do? You give them back the testosterone, they feel motivated, they go back to the gym, they get back their zest for life, they're able to stay on their diets and uh, things get better that way. And then women have a, have a more difficult challenge with this problem. Yeah, women actually, unfortunately, uh, they have to do a lot more to get the same results as men. Uh, I know that because my wife gets very frustrated. You know, we do the same exercise, but I burn twice the amount of calories. Mm -hmm. And that's because, obviously, there's more muscle mass in men, so they burn, fat, burn calories faster. But I think there's more to it than that. It's probably the Y chromosome has to do something with it, but that's my theory. <laughs> However, um, for women, especially in the menopausal age, if you don't replace their estradiol or estrogen properly, they cannot lose their belly fat. And what is there about belly fat? That's a problem for both men and women. What is there about belly fat that contributes so much to this? Yeah, it's a different kind of fat. It's not the fat that you see on the outside, but it's the fat that surrounds the organs. You know, the intestines, the liver, kidneys, there's fat around that. And that fat is metabolically very active. And you can actually measure, uh, you can either, either do CAT scans and measure it, or you can measure something called a CRP levels, which is the metabolic marker for inflammation that correlates well with the belly fat. So let me be very clear about that. If I can pinch it, that's not what we're talking about. No, we're no. talking about the stuff that's on the inside of your abdominal wall. Absolutely. You can't see it. So okay. you, but, but if, you th if you've got a watermelon belly and you can thump it, then you have some abdominal fat. Right. We use the outside fat as a marker for possible fat inside as well. But that's not always true. In fact, we get people that are, look very lean, but they're actually obese, metabolically obese. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so they lean on the outside, but if you measure, if you take CAT scans and MRIs and measure the actual visceral fat, we call that the belly fat, then you'll find increased visceral fat in these people. And this is very common in Asians. <laughs> so if you look at Asian people, Asian men particularly, they look very slim. But however, you know, if you measure the belly fat, they're quite obese. And if you measure the CRP levels up through the roof, HDLs are low, triglycerides are high. So those are markers for increased belly fat. So what can you do about that abdominal, that intra-abdominal fat? Yeah, again, coming back to the diet, intermittent fasting is very effective in reducing the uh, intra-abdominal fat. Uh, weight loss pills are also very, very effective in doing that. Uh, metformin is ex exceedingly good for this kind of thing. There's other new class of drugs called GLP-1 analogs, uh, you may have heard these names on television, Ozempic, Victoza, hmm, Trulicity. Yeah, yeah. These are all class of drugs that have been FDA approved for treating diabetes. However, you can use it off-label if the patients can afford it. Off-label use for metabolic syndrome is extremely effective. 
So give me an idea of what the course of treatment is going to be and how soon do I begin to feel better. If I follow your recommendation for intermittent fasting, get my hormones under control and, and some of these other things, how soon will I start to turn myself around? Yeah, the long answer is depends on other risk factors you have. But the short answer is within days. Days? Days. Wow. So where would you start? With you would that. start with intermittent fasting. I would start with intermittent fasting, okay? Replacing the hormones, deficient hormones. And uh, the third line would be giving them the medications that we use for diabetes off-label to treat the metabolic syndrome. Because if it's good for diabetes, it should be very good for metabolic syndrome as well. Okay, so what about the, so am I going to be able to get off my blood pressure medication? Absolutely. You'll be able to get off your blood pressure medication, you'll feel better, you'll function better. Your mental functions, your, your, your thought processes will be better. In fact, if you have depression and anxiety, those will be better as well. Wow. And what about the uh, triglycerides and, the, and my whole cholesterol profile? Am I going to yeah. be able to get off statins? It'll drop like a rock. You'll be able to get off the statins. And speaking of statins, I, I do have a bone to pick with the, uh, with the use, overuse of statins. You don't need that much statins around. Okay? You, can, you can lower cholesterol by other means. And, and what not all cholesterol needs to be lowered. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I get that. So wh what other means do I, am, I, am I lowering cholesterol? Primarily by intermittent fasting, moderate amount of exercise, uh, even use of thyroid hormones off-label. In other words, if you can use thyroid, even though your thyroid levels are normal, to lower cholesterol. Oh, okay. We've done that very successfully in our practice. We call it off-label use of thyroid. It's a very cheap way to lower, non-statin way to lower your cholesterol, and it's very effective. Excellent. That, boy, I've learned a lot here today. Heather, you have another question. This come in on the text line, is that correct? About uh, diabetes and veins, is that right? Yes, they want to know how does diabetes affect the veins. Yeah, well, diabetes primarily uh, by virtue of insulin resistance can cause atherosclerosis or narrowing of blood vessels. It can also do the same process in the veins. It can cause, you know, put your risk for venous thrombosis or cl blood clots in the veins. Though primarily the effect of diabetes is on the arteries. Got it. So arteries, not veins. Yeah, different. Right. Veins go back to the heart, arteries supply veins out of the heart. So one of the problems with diabetes is that you have this buildup of glucose in your blood, and glucose can be, it forms kind of a very sticky kind of substance. And tell me about the damage that it does to eyes, kidneys, and such. Yeah. So what it does is typically they call it a microvascular damage. In other words, it causes leakage, leakage of the capillary, capillaries of the fine blood vessels in the eyes, the kidneys, and the skin in different areas of the body, and the brain as well. So it can cause, lead to blindness, you know, kidney failure, heart attacks. So all the more reason to not let yourself drift from metabolic syndrome into full-blown diabetes. Right. It's like a tug of war. You need to, you know, push the, push the, uh, the, uh, the, the pull the rope in the direction of uh, norm, more normalcy. So on the one hand, you have metabolic syndrome. On the hand, you have frank diabetes. So this gray area in between. You need, you're playing in that area mostly. So if I go talk to my doctor about intermittent fasting, are, are you on the leading edge of things, or, or is that now pretty well medically established that it's helpful? Yeah, I would like to think so, that we're on the leading edge of things. In fact, I just came back from a conference in Austin. The, there was a lecturer from, uh, from Canada. Apparently, a lot of research has been done in Canada about this. And um, he was you know, absolutely beating the table on intermittent fasting. You know, He said... Uh, this is the first line of the treatment you need to, to offer your patients with metabolic syndrome, and I can see why, because it really, really lowers your insulin levels. In fact, even before you lose your weight, your insulin level drops. Wow. So there's no reason, no, are there any conditions in which I shouldn't be launching an intermittent fasting program? Yeah, if you've got other, other unresolved issues like you know chest pain, cardiovascular, acute problems, don't do that, obviously. Um, Outside of that, I don't see why you cannot use it. You could use it for uh, practically anybody. Excellent. Wow. So that's a pretty significant change in the way that we need to be thinking about things. Intermittent fasting gets the endorsement from Dr. Ashok Kadambi from Fort Wayne Endocrinology. And if you would like to learn more, you can always visit them, visit them online at fwendo.com. That's fwendo.com. And that will put you in touch with Dr. Ashok Kadambi from Fort Wayne Endocrinology. Thank you so much for being with us today. We hope that you'll get your metabolic syndrome under control and enjoy life a little more because we'd like to have you around next week for Health Call Live.